Welcome to Ducky Channel. Thank you for joining me for part three of the brief of defendant appellate Stephen A. Avery. We're going to start off where we left off with argument. Argument. Section one. The circuit court abused its discretion in denying Mr. Avery motion to vacate its October 3rd, 2017 order and allow additional scientific testing. On September 18, 2017, a meeting took place in Madison, Wisconsin, in which Kathleen Zellner and Douglas Johnson, current post-conviction counsel, together with prosecutors Thomas Fallon, Norm Gaughan, and Mark Williams, prosecutors, reached an agreement regarding additional forensic testing. Number 1. The RAP4 WSCL Item A would be made available to current post-conviction counsel's expert Dr. Carl Reich, Dr. Reich, and Dr. Christopher Palnick, Dr. Palnick, for a complete examination of the interior and exterior of the RAP4 for additional forensic evidence to be tested. The examination was to take place at the Calumet County Sheriff's Department, CCSD, who has possession of the RAP4. In addition to gathering forensic evidence from the RAP4's interior and exterior, the agreement provided for collecting swabs for testing from the following items. A. Battery cables. B. Bar under the driver's seat. C. Hood latch. And D. Interior hood release. Number two. The prosecutors also agreed that Mr. Avery would be allowed to do the following. A. Conduct more sensitive DNA testing of the license plate WSCL items AJ and AK. B. Conduct DNA testing of the lug wrench WSCL item A16. And C. Dr. Stephen Symes, Dr. Symes, and Dr. Eisenberg would conduct a microscopic examination of the pelvic bone number 8675 discovered in the Manitowoc County gravel pit to determine if they were human in origin. When current post-conviction counsel inquired as to whether the circuit court should immediately be informed of the agreement, Prosecutor Fallon stated that once he had finalized the scheduling of the Rev4 examination with the CCSD, a stipulator order would be presented to the circuit court similar to the order stipulated order for independent scientific testing that was presented by the parties to the circuit court and entered on November 23, 2016. Prosecutors stated that they would schedule the RAP4 testing in the very near future before the weather worsened. The parties also agreed that, at that time, they would purpose dates for the potential evidentiary hearing. Neither side anticipated the circuit court filing its order prior to the time Mr. Avery could notify the court of the matter set forth herein. On October 3, 2017, the Circuit Court entered an order dismissing Mr. Avery's Wisconsin Statute 974.06 motion for relief. On October 6, 2017, current post-conviction counsel spoke to prosecutors and informed them that Mr. Avery was filing a motion to vacate the October 3, 2017 order. Prior to filing the motion, current post-conviction counsel presented the motion to prosecutors, and prosecutors agreed to the factual accuracy of the representation regarding the content of the September 18, 2017 meeting made in the motion. The state did not file an objection to the motion. The court did not issue its ruling until November 28, 2017. The circuit court denied Mr. Avery's motion for relief from judgment. The parties were not required to submit proposals for further scientific testing for approval by the circuit court because of the prior order of the trial court, entered on April 4, 2007. Therefore, the circuit court clearly abused its discretion when it denied Mr. Avery's motion for relief from judgment. A. Standard of Review an order granting or denying relief under Wisconsin Statute 806.07 will not be reversed on appeal unless there has been a clear abuse of discretion, Mullen v. Coulomb. Under Wisconsin Statute 806.07, a defendant must first file a motion with the trial court to obtain relief from a judgment or order before appealing. Otherwise, the issue will be deemed unreviewable. It is undisputed that 806.07 governs civil actions, State Excel Rao, Landowski v. Callaway, and proceedings under 974.06 are proper 
are properly considered civil in nature. Wisconsin Statute 974.06 State v. Hayes, 2004. Rules of practice in civil actions apply in all criminal proceedings, quote, unless the context of the rule manifestly requires a different conclusion. Section B. The circuit court erred in not complying with the prior trial court order regarding scientific testing. The original stipulated order for independent scientific testing was presented by the parties to the circuit court and entered by it on November 23, 2016. The order made express reference to and relied upon the trial court's April 4, 2007 order on preservation of blood evidence and independent defense testing. In order to facilitate compliance with the order on preservation of blood evidence and independent defense testing by agreement of the parties. The trial court entered the order in 2007 contemplating future scientific developments for DNA testing. The 2007 order provides, in pertinent part, the state shall preserve indefinitely until further order of this court all blood stings that the state believes contains Steve Avery's DNA and that were found in or on Teresa Halbach's vehicle in a condition suitable for further scientific testing. The defendant, Stephen E. Avery, or any lawyer representing him, may any time submit the bloodstained swabs and items described above to any laboratory or person the defense may choose for independent scientific testing pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 971.23 without further order of this court. For purposes of illustration, not limitation, this paragraph expressly contemplates independent defense testing during any state or federal post-conviction proceedings, if any, or after any such post-conviction proceedings. Emphasis added. As demonstrated by the trial court's April 4, 2007 order, Mr. Avery was given the authority at any time to submit items of evidence for DNA testing. When current post-conviction counsel entered into the stipulated order in 2016 with the state. The testing items were expanded to include the RAV4 key and the bullet number FL. As discussed previously, the September 18, 2017 agreement between the parties expanded the items for DNA testing even further, but it is compliant with the spirit of the April 4, 2007 order, which allowed Mr. Avery to seek additional DNA testing as DNA technology improved. Any DNA evidence from a complete forensic examination of the RAV4 would be consequential to Mr. Avery's conviction because the state's case hinged on the assumption that Mr. Avery's and Mrs. Halbach's biological material, to the exclusion of all others, was present in the RAV4. If biological material from another individual with no innocent explanation for having been in the RAV4 is detected therein, that exculpatory evidence would create a reasonable probability of a different outcome in the satisfaction of State versus O'Brien, because it would support the third party and frame up defenses Mr. Avery has advanced since before his 2007 trial. See State versus Denny. Exculpatory evidence detected on re-examination, quote, must be considered against the other evidence presented at trial to determine if it is reasonably probable that the movement would not have been convicted. Male DNA was detected on the RAV4 license plates, but was insufficient for a profile. However, with more sensitive and advanced DNA testing developed, since the trial, a full profile may be detected, which would rule out Mr. Avery as the person who removed the license plates from Mrs. Halbach's vehicle. Since it is undisputed that the license plates were removed from Mrs. Halbach's vehicle after her murder, the detection of a full DNA profile would be consequential to Mr. Avery's conviction and would satisfy O'Brien. And if Mr. Avery is excluded from the profile, it could create a reasonable probability of the different outcome. Pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 974.07, a criminal defendant may move the circuit court for post-conviction testing when the MOVA can show that the evidence is relevant to the investigation or prosecution. The evidence is in the possession of the government agency and that the evidence has not previously been subjected to DNA testing or, if previously tested, may be tested using newer technique. Wisconsin Statute 974.07. Wisconsin Statute 974.07 provides as follows. 
If the evidence has previously been tested, it may now be subjected to another test using a scientific te technique that was not available or was not utilized at the time of the previous testing, and that provides a reasonable likelihood of more accurate and probative results. The circuit court clearly abused its discretion in not vacating its October 3, 2017 order in light of the explicit language of the trial court's April 4, 2007 order. Moreover, the parties reached an agreement in reliance on the circuit court's April 4, 2007 order, which provided the parties with the authority to test forensic evidence without seeking an additional court order. Mr. Avery should be relieved of the October 3rd order because he has provided sufficient reason to justify that the circuit court reached an erroneous conclusion of law by not recognizing the existence of the April 4th, 2007 order. Because the conviction of Mr. Avery was primarily based on forensic evidence, further forensic testing is agreed upon by the parties has a reasonable likelihood of yielding exculpatory evidence that is consequential to Mr. Avery's conviction and would create a reasonable probability of a different outcome. It is noteworthy that current post-conviction counsel has paid for all the testing done today and intend to pay for testing performed pursuant to the party's September 18, 2017 agreement, so no financial burden is imposed upon the state. It is a clear abuse of discretion for the circuit court to deprive both sides of additional testing, which will be performed at Mr. Avery's expense. Section 2. The circuit court abused its discretion in summarily dismissing Mr. Avery's second motion pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 974.06 without addressing the five Brady claims raised and in subsequently denying Mr. Avery's motion to supplement which raised a sixth Brady claim, all of which deprived him of due process in violation of the Wisconsin and United States Constitution. A Standard of Review to establish a Brady violation, a defendant must demonstrate that 1. The prosecution suppressed evidence, 2. The evidence was favorable to the defense, and 3. The evidence was material to an issue at trial, State v. Harris, 2004. This court reviews de novo whether the facts of the case establish a Brady violation, State v. Rocketet, 2006. There can be a due process violation irrespective of the good faith or bad faith of the prosecution. The prosecution's duty to disclose evidence favorable to the accused includes the duty to disclose impeachment evidence as well as exculpatory evidence. The circuit court failed to address any of Mr. Avery's five Brady violations filed in his motion to reconsider in its supplements, but concluded, quote, there is no argument or showing of sufficient reason as to why these issues could not have been raised in prior motions. Without such sufficient reason, these arguments are precluded from any subsequent motion. Part B. Brady Violation Re. Mr. Ramlow. The Circuit Court failed to recognize that it's axiomatic that the discovery of the Brady violation subsequent to filing a motion pursuant to 974.02 or 974.06 constitutes a sufficient reason for failing to raise the issue in a prior motion. See State v. Allen. Noting a defendant's unawareness of the legal bias of his claim may constitute a sufficient reason in satisfaction of 974.06. The defendant's unawareness of the factual basis of his claim was extricably intertwined with the legal basis of his claim. Pre-trial trial defense counsel made two specific requests pursuant to Wisconsin Statute 971.23 for all exculpatory evidence and or information within the possession, knowledge, or control of the state, which would tend to negate the guilt of the defendant or which would tend to affect the weight or credibility of the evidence used against the defendant, including any inconsistent statements. A second request was made by trial defense counsel for Brady material immediately before trial on January 18, 2007. In July of 2017, a new witness, Kevin Ramlow, Mr. Ramlow, came forward and described the most significant Brady violation in the case to the point in time. 
Clearly, current post-conviction counsel could not have included Mr. Ramlow's affidavit in the June 7, 2017 filing since Mr. Ramlow had not yet come forward with the evidence that established a Brady violation. Mr. Ramlow has provided an affidavit and supplemental affidavit to the current post-conviction counsel. In these affidavits, Mr. Ramlow described observing Mrs. Halbach's RAV4 parked at the turnaround at State Highway 147 and the East Twin River Bridge on November 3rd and 4th, 2005. On November 4th, Mr. Ramlow disclosed his observation about seeing the vehicle during a con uh, conversation with Sergeant Colburn at the Cynic Station in Mishcott. Immediately prior to the conversation with Sergeant Colburn, Mr. Ramlow observed the missing person poster of Ms. Halbach posted on one of the doors to the Cynic Station and recognized the vehicle on the poster as the vehicle he had seen two days in a row at the Highway 147 in the East Twin River Bridge. On December 12th and 19th, 2016, after watching the Netflix documentary Making a Murderer more than a year after its release, Mr. Ramlow, who lived in Michigan, sent text messages to Mr. Tadich, telling him that he recognized Sergeant Colburn from the documentary and that Sergeant Colburn was the officer with whom he had spoke on November 4th, 2005, at the Senate Station in Mishkot. Mr. Tadich never responded to Mr. Ramlow's specific request to be put in contact with Brendan's attorneys. Mr. Ramlow's observation of the RAV4 on November 3rd and 4th, 2005 is material to the defense theory that evidence was planted to frame Mr. Avery. If the RAV4 was spotted at the turnaround on Highway 147 on November 3rd and 4th, 2005, then it must have been moved and planted on the Avery property before it was discovered on November 5th, 2005. Clearly, this information supports Trial Defense Counsel's theory that the RAV4 was planted on the Avery Salvage Yard on November 5, 2005, and that, contrary to the state's theory, it is possible to access the Avery property and plant the vehicle. Mr. Ramlow's testimony would have established that Mr. Avery was framed for Ms. Halbach's murder. A key issue in determining if the RAV4 was planted was the credibility of Sergeant Colburn. At trial, Sergeant Colburn testified that he was not looking at the RAV4 when he made his dispatch call regarding the vehicle's license plate number. The state argued that Sergeant Colburn made the call on November 3rd to confirm the accuracy of the RAV4 license plate number previously given to him that day. Because trial defense counsel did not have a police report documenting Sergeant Colburn's conversation with Mr. Ramlow, they could not impeach Sergeant Colburn's regarding his denial. If trial defense counsel had been aware of the conversation between Sergeant Colburn and Mr. Ramlow, Mr. Ramlow could have been called as a witness to impeach Sergeant Colburn. Sergeant Colburn would have been discredited and the jury would have been provided material information proving that the RAV4 was originally at the turnaround on Highway 147 and was subsequently planted on the Avery property. The United States Supreme Court in Weary v. Kane Brady applies to evidence undermining witness credibility. Evidence qualifies as material when there is, quote, any reasonable likelihood it could have affected the judgment of the jury. To prevail on his Brady claim, we need not show that he, more likely than not, would have been acquitted had the new evidence been admitted. The only evidence the state presented that the RAV4 was not planted on the Avery property on October 31, 2005, was a testimony that the 15, 20-foot high berm prevented access to the Avery property where the RAV4 was found. However, Prosecutor Kratz conceded the weakness of that argument when he admitted in his closing that the RAV4 couldn't be driven into that property unless somebody knew that property. The only other evidence presented by the state that the RAV4 never left the Avery property on October, after October 31, 2005, was Bobby's testimony that the RAV4 was still present when he left the Avery property at 2.45 p.m. Trial Defense Counsel presented no evidence from witness that the RAV4 was planted and simply argued in the closing that there was, quote, lots of ways to get in and for someone to plant the vehicle. The failure of the state to disclose Mr. Ramlow's interview with Sergeant Colburn is material because it would have established that the vehicle not only left the Avery property, but that it was brought back to the property and planted. If the RAV4 left the property, the state's theory that Mrs. Halbach's murder occurred exclusively on the Avery property would be completely debunked. 
If Mr. Ramlow's interview with Sergeant Colburn had been disclosed to trial defense counsel and revealed to the jury by having Mr. Ramlow testify to impeach Sergeant Colburn, there is a reasonable probability that the result of the proceeding would have been different. A reasonable probability is a probability sufficient to undermine confidence in the outcome. Harris, 272. Footnote 8. Current post-conviction counsel has obtained an affidavit from a second witness, Paul Burdick, on June 28, 2018, who also saw the RAV4 parked at the turnaround on 147 on October 31, 2005. Although this witness did not report this information to the police, he does cooperate, Mr. and it stops there. C. Brady Violation Re. Mr. Radon. The state committed a second Brady violation related to the RAV4 being planted when it failed to disclose information in a police report that the Department of Justice DOJ investigators provided to Joshua Radant, Mr. Radant, about its belief that the RAV4 was planted on the Avery property. Mr. Radant had provided an affidavit to current post-conviction counsel that states the following. At that time, around November 5, 2005, I was told by the Department of Justice agents that they believed Teresa Halbach's vehicle was driven to the Cuss Road cul-de-sac by driving west through an empty field, then south down the gravel road past a hunting camp until reaching an intersection with a gravel road that ran northeast into the Avery property. They told me that they believed Teresa Halbach's vehicle turned northeast onto that gravel road and entered the Avery property at its southwest corner. DOJ investigators never authored a report about the information they provided to Mr. Radant. Mr. Radant's affidavit is similar to Mr. Ramlow's affidavit in that it directly contradicts the state's denial that the RAV4 was planted. Furthermore, Mr. Radant's affidavit contradicts the state's representation to the jury that the Avery property was inaccessible from the Radant pit. Mr. Radant could have been called as a witness to refute the state's claim that the RAV4 was not planted and to impeach the statements about the inaccessibility of the Avery property from the Redont gravel pit. Part D. Brady Violation Re-Original Flyover Video Taken on November 4, 2005 On November 4, 2005, Wendy Baldwin, Mrs. Baldwin, and CCSD Sheriff Jerry Pogel conducted a flyover searching for the RAV4. They were in the air for around four hours, yet produced only three minutes of flyover footage. Prosecutor Kratz made a material admission when he told the jury that the RAV4 was not visible in the flyover video because he claimed the vehicle was covered with branches. However, the edited version did not show the southeast corner of the salvage yard at all, much less a vehicle covered with branches. Therefore, a reasonable inference from this statement to the jury is that Prosecutor Kratz saw the unedited flyover video. If the video was unintentionally edited to delete the footage of the southeast corner, this is a Brady violation because the issue of whether the RAV4 was planted was material to Mr. Avery's conviction. An evidentiary hearing is necessary to determine the credibility of the state's claim that only three minutes of flyover footage exists and that there were no deletions of the flyover video. Part E. Brady Violations Re Zipper Voicemail Mrs. Halbach left a voicemail on the zipper answering machine when she could not find their residence on October 31, 2005. On November 3rd, when the zipperers were interviewed at 9.30 p.m., they told the investigators about Mrs. Halbach's message. On November 3rd, 2005, Mrs. Halbach's voicemail was listened to by Detective Remaker of the MCSD and copied by MCSD Detective Dennis Jacobs, Detective Jacobs, onto a CD. The CD was never turned over to trial defense counsel and has allegedly disappeared. On April 20, 2017, Prosecutor Fallon confirmed by letter to current post-conviction counsel that neither Calumet nor Manitowoc Sheriff Department have been able to locate the CD of Ms. Halbach's voicemail. The contents of the zipper or voicemail may have contradicted the timeline established by the state that Ms. Halbach's last stop was the Avery Salvage Yard. Suspiciously, the state never played the recording of the voicemail for the jury but they attempted to introduce its contents through Joellen Zipper, Mrs. Zipper. Mrs. Zipper's unimpeached testimony on the contents was that Mrs. Halbach came to the Zipper's property between 2 and 2.30 p.m. 
corroboration of the assertion that the voicemail would have contradicted the state's timeline is found in the recorded conversation between Investigator Weir and Detective Rimmaker on November 5, 2005, about the sequence of Ms. Halbach's appointments on October 31, 2005. In the conversation which occurred after interviews with Mr. Schmitz, Mr. Avery, and Mr. Zipperer, they concluded that Mrs. Halbach's first appointment was with Mr. Schmitz, her second appointment was with the Averys, and her third appointment was with the Zipperers. It is reasonable to infer that Investigator Weger and Detective Rimmaker based their conclusion on the Zipperer voicemail left by Ms. Halbach, which was listened to by investigators on November 3, 2005, at the Zipper residence, recorded to a CD on November 6, 2005, and withheld from trial defense counsel. Clearly, the Zipper CD is material evidence that could have been used to impeach Mrs. Zipper on the timeline and would have refuted the state's entire theory that Miss Halbach's last stop was at the Avery property. Part F. Brady Violations Re. Mrs. Heidel. Mrs. Heidel has provided current post-conviction counsel with an affidavit that states she had a telephone conversation with Ms. Halbach on October 31, 2005, at 11.35 a.m. while Ms. Halbach was driving. Ms. Halbach pulled her vehicle over to make notations on her day planner as she engaged in conversation with Ms. Heidel. There's no evidence that Ms. Halbach returned home after this conversation. According to Ms. Heidel's According to Mrs. Heidel's affidavit, she reported this conversation to law enforcement, including the fact that Mrs. Halbach was driving and pulled over to check her schedule and make notations about the conversation. No report of Heidel Halbach conversation was ever turned over to Mr. Avery's trial defense counsel, and the state never mentioned Mrs. Heidel's call to Ms. Halbach at trial. It is a reasonable inference that Mrs. Halbach's day planner was in the RAV4 with her at the time of her murder. Mrs. Halbach's ex-boyfriend, Mr. Hillegas, was in possession of the day planner after Ms. Halbach's murder, according to one of Ms. Halbach's friends. Items from the RAV4 have particular relevance since many things were missing that should have been present in the vehicle, such as Ms. Halbach's purse, wallet, driver's license, money, schedules, receipts, maps, toy and master key, house key, and other items related to her activities with Auto Trader or her hustle shots. It is undisputed that items were removed from her vehicle to conceal the crime. Anyone in possession of those items would qualify as a Denny suspect because it would establish a direct link to the crime. If Ms. Heidel's report of her telephone conversation with Ms. Halbach had been disclosed to trial defense counsel by the state, it could have been used to directly connect Mr. Hall Hillegas to the crime and firm up Mr. Avery's theory and taken it beyond mere speculation. State versus Wilson. Cause the days are gonna whisper And the months are gonna talk Until they give you love the truth Time will tell Time will tell on you When a train whistles far away And when the 